um, how could we imagine that feeling? You sit on a bomb. Um, how you managed your fear? Uh, the shuttle was the most capable flying machine ever built. Uh, the most complicated flying machine ever built, and therefore one of the most dangerous flying machines ever built. Um, but uh, three quarters of everybody who's ever flown to space flew on the space shuttle, an amazing ship, and I, I flew on it twice. And you're laying on your back. <laughs> like this, going that way. And, and the, 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 it's like someone has their, their foot in your back, and they're just hurling you up to space. And, or like a whole bunch of people are laying on top of you, slapping you in the face. And, and you're just getting violently um, separated from the world. Uh, and it gets rougher and rougher and rougher. And how do you deal with the danger of it? The real key is to uh, separate natural fear from actual danger. Because it's, it's so much easier just to be afraid of things. But in truth, if you can try and dig into what is the actual danger right now? And in the cockpit we say, uh, what's the next thing that's going to kill me? What's the next thing that's going to kill me? Because then you really focus on the actual danger and then you practice what you're going to do thousands and thousands of times so that when you actually fly, um, the fear is changed. You don't have your basic... Um, Chihuahua fear of something, you have you have a new learned reaction to danger and it allows you to do something that otherwise would be impossible. Sorry for the long answer. This is yeah. one picture from you. I've, I took this picture. I've, I, uh, I've been around the world uh, 2,597 times. <laughs> I, I also, didn't count. I didn't count. Gleich <laughs> Somebody else counted. I didn't count. 2,597. And you're busy on the space station. It's an incredibly busy laboratory with an enormous list of things to do. But every time you get a few spare minutes, uh, you're drawn to the windows because the whole world is just pouring by underneath you at eight kilometers a second. So uh, every chance you get, you go to the window to see what you can see and, and maybe to have a chance to photograph something beautiful. And there's a gigantic fjord and there's the, the seaway that drains the whole upper right side of North America. Um, and there's so much history and geology and, and uh, life of Earth all in one glance out the window. Uh, it's, and, and the world constantly shows you new things. It's like, it's like you have an intimate relationship with Earth and, and she's constantly showing you something different every time you come around. It's, it's a magnificent place to take photographs. <laughs> In your book you wrote The Square Astronaut Ground Hold Dilemma. This is the story of my life. Why? Uh, engineers are interesting people. Uh, I am one. Yeah, but they don't always talk to other engineers. And the engineers who built the spaceship, they recognize that the safest, most uh, structurally sound way to build a hatch is to make it round. But the engineers who built spacesuits, they thought, well, the best way to put a backpack on somebody with shoulders is to make it square. And so who is in the middle? The astronaut has to take his square self with the big backpack and somehow go through a round hatch. And, and it's, it's hard, and, and people get stuck where they get jammed. Um, but it's actually a metaphor, of course, for uh, life is full of round holes when you're a square astronaut. And, and how do you turn, how do you modify yourself or the hole so that there's a chance of going through something that at first seems impossible? Small story, uh, when I was uh, on board Mir on the Russian space station in my first space flight, living on Mir, 
was a German astronaut, Tomas Reiter. And Tomas and I are the same age. And I was, I was telling Tomas about how when I was nine years old and I watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon, and I dreamed of becoming an astronaut, but uh, Canada didn't even have an astronaut program, so I was the ultimate square peg for a round hole. And Tomas smiled, and uh, if you can imagine the two of us having this conversation with everybody else floating through upside down on the space station, but Tomas smiled and said he had exactly the same experience as a nine-year-old boy in Germany back then, um, watching Neil and Buzz walk on the moon, being hugely inspired, but having no program. But both of us realized that uh, we could not change uh, our national or international space programs. All we could really change and control was ourselves and try and turn ourselves into someone that maybe someday might have a chance to fly in space. And it was delightful to be able to have that conversation and discover that about Tomas when the two of us were floating weightless on a Russian spaceship. And the crowning of a world aufenthalt is of course a world spaziergang. And let's take us mal in the stimmung versetzen. So, the peak of journey into space um, walk. Is, uh, is a space walk. So now, Chris will. <laughs> yeah. Time to go out. Now we'll be back. Yes. That night, this is the night before, I felt like a little kid on Christmas Eve. I wanted to get to sleep right away to make the morning come faster. But the visuals were more appropriate to Halloween. On the shuttle, we slept in sleeping bags uh, that were tethered to the walls and the ceilings. So uh, it was an oddly macabre uh, den of human chrysalises hovering and still. And I, but I woke in the night and I checked the uh, green light on my Omega Speedmaster astronaut watch, um, but it said there were still hours to go. Everyone else was fast asleep. And I fell back asleep too, until with a burst of static, the small speaker in the shuttle mid-deck erupted with wake-up music from uh, Houston, a song my wife, Helena, uh, had chosen for me called Northwest Passage by Stan Rogers, one of my favorite folk singers. So I s floated and slipped carefully out of my sleeping bag. I found the space shuttle microphone, and I said thanks to my family and to everyone at Mission Control and started to get ready to go outside. And there are multiple sequential steps, vital steps to follow for a spacewalk, for an EVA. Uh, you mess one up and you won't make it out of the spaceship. And it would be many busy hours until Scott and I could float out of the airlock that, and, and NASA had choreographed those moments down to five minute slices, even dictating when and what to eat for breakfast. I had power bars and rehydrated grapefruit juice. And, and I shaved and I washed up and I used the toilet. I didn't want to have to use my diaper uh, uh, if I could possibly help it. And then I pulled on my uh, liquid cooling garment, which is like long underwear, but with a lot of personality. It's full of, of clear plastic tubing, um, tubing that the water flows through so we can control the temperature. It feels... I have a question. Yes, ma'am. After watching Gravity, I thought, like, you only have this pen on the top and on the long underwear. No. No, gravity is not a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Um, you pull on the suit and it feels stiff, like a, like a cheap Halloween costume. But that doesn't matter when you're outside. When the sun is shining on you during a spacewalk, the fabric of the suit gets extremely hot and the personal air conditioning seems like a good idea. About four hours later, Scott and I were finally floating head to toe in our spacesuits, carefully and slowly depressurizing the airlock and checking and rechecking the LED displays on our suits to make sure that they were functioning properly and could keep us alive in the vacuum of space. If we got out there and somehow there was a leak in the suit, our lungs would rupture, our eardrums would burst, our saliva and sweat and tears would boil, and we'd get the bends. The, the only good news is that within about 10 to 15 seconds, we'd lose consciousness. Uh, and lack of oxygen is, to the brain is what would eventually finish us off. But bobbing gently in the airlock, I'm not pondering my demise. This is the restful part of the day. A little like the point in a cross-country flight across the US when you look out the window and you see Nebraska. Um, we'll be busy, busy again at some future point, but now we are in limbo, still hooked up to the ship by our umbilicals, uh, an anaconda-like hose providing cooling and oxygen and communications and power. And when the airlock is finally depressurized, I grab the handle on the hatch and turn it. And, and not easily, because nothing in a spacesuit is all that easy. And I talk uh, calmly to Houston as I turn, but when it clicks into place, and I feel the hatch move, uh, I think, it's opening. On a previous mission, the handle had jammed, just locked up completely, and the astronauts had had to give up and, and stay back inside the shuttle and never do their spacewalk. The hatch itself is almost like a manhole cover, uh, and it has to be removed and stowed in a bike rack-like contraption overhead. And I still can't see outside because of the white fabric insulating cover over the opening. But suddenly the airlock is brighter, bathed in the muffled sunshine. But once I stow the fabric cover, I'm looking at the payload bay of the shuttle itself with just a sliver of the universe in my field of view. And of course, all I want to do is get out there, but detaching the umbilical is a production. You have to really carefully undo it because the connectors are fragile and then shroud it and then mount it securely to the wall so it's ready in case you have to race back into the airlock to stay alive. Time to go out. Oh, the uh, square astronaut round hole fell out. Um, my exit will not be graceful, but my number one concern at this point is to avoid floating off into space. So just as we've been taught, I am tethered to Scott, who's attached to structure, and I'm holding another tether to attach to a rail uh, mounted on the side of the shuttle. So I lower the gold shield on my visor to protect my eyes from the sun and uh, carefully, gingerly, wriggle my bulky, square self out of the airlock. But I'm still inside the, the belly of the beast, in the payload bay. But my suit has become my own personal spaceship. It's responsible for keeping me alive. Emerging from the bay, my existence focuses to a, a narrow point, attaching my tether to the braided wire that strung from one end of the vehicle to the other. I lock onto that. I tell everyone I'm securely tethered. Now Scott can detach inside and come out and join me. And waiting for him, I check behind me and to make sure I haven't accidentally activated, activated my backup tank of oxygen. And that's when I notice the universe. The scale is, is graphically shocking. The colors, too, the incongruity is stupefying. There I was inside a small box, but now, how is this possible? And what's coming out of my mouth is a single word. Wow. <laughs> Only it's elongated. Wow. <laughs> but my mind is racing, trying to understand and articulate what I'm seeing to find analogies for an experience that's so unique. It's, it's like this, I think. It's like being engrossed in cleaning a pane of, of a window, a pane of glass, and then you look over your shoulder and you realize you're hanging on the side of the Empire State Building. <laughs> with Manhattan sprawled vividly beneath and around you. Intellectually, i know known I was venturing out into space, and yet still the sight of it shocked me profoundly. 
And in a spacesuit, you're not aware of taste or smell or touch. The only sounds you hear are your own breathing and through the headsets of disembodied voices. You're in a self-contained bubble, cut off. But then you look up from your task, and the universe just rudely slaps you in the face. It's overpowering visually. And no other senses warn you that you're about to be attacked by Rob Beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let us have a look at the pictures you brought. You may. Okay, so <laughs> as you go around the world, uh, you some things really stand out, are really clear. And, and the things that have high contrast. And you're always looking to figure out where you are. And this one, of course, you look, can you dim the lights, please? This one, of course, you look and you see the river. And it's easy to see the man-made harbors here, all the different places to unload the ships. And so you see the river, and then you see the city on the side of the river, and there's the airport, and a little lake. And so where is this? Hamburg, right, this is Hamburg. I, my son had been sending me emails saying, Dad, take a picture of Hamburg. My, my friend lives there. I want to give him a picture of Hamburg. So, <laughs> so this is a picture of Hamburg. Next picture, please. No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. But it was not so easy. No. No, it, it was hard to find. In Hamburg, uh, it, it's often hazy, and uh, there was a lot of cloud, and we were waiting for winter to end. And so uh, finally spring came, and I, I finally, it took months, but I finally got a good picture of Hamburg. Also, I had more than a month to get a picture of Hamburg, because there is always schlecht weather. Okay, so the next picture, the next picture. Um, you go around the world every 92 minutes. And so if that's the sun, that means you come racing around the world, you get a very fast sunrise. You get about 50 minutes of sun, and then about 40 minutes of dark. Sun, dark, sun, dark. 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. But that means almost half the time you're in the dark. And uh, so at nighttime, you see huge thunderstorms. They, they stand out beautifully with the lightning. But of course, you look for the big cities of the world, and the cities of Europe. And uh, I took this picture uh, of a city in Europe. And um, well, I was just taking, it's, you have to really concentrate to get a good picture because, because you don't want to shake the camera and, and you're floating the camera to keep it from blurring. But if you're careful, you can get, even with a long exposure, a, a nice, clear picture of a city at night. It wasn't until I, I took the little chip out of the back of the camera, and I put it in my mouth, and I put a new one in the camera, and then I floated down to my crew quarters, stuck the little memory chip in my computer, and then was flicking through the pictures, and I looked at the picture, and I realized that the, the street lights are green in part of the city and yellow in the other part of the city. And in fact, even though it's been almost 25 years, you can see where the wall was in Berlin from space. It's an amazing artifact of history um, that, that will linger until someone decides to change half of the street lights in Berlin. <laughs> you, you took this photo in 2012 or? Yeah. Yeah. Also 2012 hat er das Foto gemacht, 2013 hat er das Foto gemacht. Also man sieht nach 25 Jahren immer noch die geteilte Stadt. Okay. Next. So now we'll play an astronaut game, right? You look, you look at the picture and say, where are we? Okay, what are the big features that I see? I see a river. Okay, so there's a big twisty river. And I see... Airport, so there's an airport, and I see old habitation patterns. This isn't the United States, because uh, the United States was settled in a hurry, and, and so all of the habitation is very regular, and these are old style villages. So, so we have a big river, we have an airport, and we have an old habitation pattern. And if you look close, you can even see boats in the river, and there's bridges across the river, and then if you look, this is a town, and it's a very old pattern town um, strung along the river. And if you look very, very closely, you can see a great big church right there. Okay. Okay. Yes, you're right. It's Cologne. It's Cologne. And I spent several um, years training here at the uh, 
European Astronaut Center. This is, this is where the, Europe, the East astronauts work and train. Space Station. We keep busy on board the space station. Long days, lots of work, physical exercise. At the end of it, you're tired. But how do you sleep in space? In order to make it comfortable for the astronauts, originally they were going to put us all in one habitation module with sleep stations all around. But the way the station was eventually built, we have sleep stations inside Node 2, which is the forward part of the station, and inside the service module, which is in the aft. A total of six small bedroom sleep stations, sleep pods. And inside each one is just a sleeping bag tied to the wall. You might think it's uncomfortable not having a mattress and a pillow, but without gravity, of course, you don't need anything to hold you up. You can just completely relax. And you don't even need a pillow. In space, you don't even have to hold your head up. So you can relax every muscle in your body, and your arms float up in front of you, your head tips you up. But before I go to sleep, I gotta put on my pajamas. Because I have space pajamas. Right. I'm in my super comfy Russian full length pajamas. <laughs> nice for when you have to get up in the middle of the night and uh, ready to go to bed. I'll show you where I sleep. and wait a minute, um, every so often, depending on where you are around the world and how busy the sun is being, but every so often you see a flash in one eye. And what it is, um, is high energy particles coming from our sun and coming from all the other stars that exist. And normally we're protected from them because of the atmosphere and the water vapor. But when you're above the atmosphere, uh, those particles, those uh, heavy particles, are going through your body all the time. And you can actually see the radiation going through your body when it hits one of your optic nerves. So it's kind of a reminder that um, that you're not in Kansas uh, anymore. <laughs> and I, I was picturing when I was up there on my first space flight, I wonder what the first astronaut thought when he saw those. I bet you didn't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm not telling see flashes. But then you can see two cosmonauts up there floating going, so, do you see flashes? <laughs> going, yeah, I see flashes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see flashes up there. <laughs> Later on, they make a research on that. Oh yeah, we've done lots of research to measure, and we have all sorts of human body simulators on board, um, tissue simulators, tissue equivalent counters and such, to try and truly understand the radiation environment. Because if we're going to go further, we, we need to understand what the radiation environment really is and how heavily we need to armor the ships in the future to protect us. 
So you should know many different things. For example, you have to operate a rocket. You have to solve computer problem. In case of an emergency, you have to perform basic surgery or even extract a tooth. So this is not one job. This is more the intersection of many different jobs, or? Um, on the Soyuz, there are three of us. And uh, we launched to the station, and there's only three people up there. So if our rocket has a problem, like right now, uh, Alex Gerst, uh, one of the German astronauts, and an American and a Russian, they're in Baikonur, getting ready to launch. They're gonna launch on the 28th. But on the space station, there are just three people. So uh, if, if what, for whatever reason that rocket doesn't launch on time, those three people could be up there for six months or nine months. So every single skill that, that you might need in six months, they have to have. And as you just said, it could be taking out each other's appendix or pulling a tooth or reprogramming the computers at the station or doing an emergency spacewalk or making an IMAX movie or <laughs> everything. Everything you might need. And so the training is incredibly long. I worked in the hospital in Houston. Uh, I trained in the, all the different contact lab, the eyeball lab, the burn ward, and then until I had all the skills. And then I worked in emergency. And as people came in injured and shot and everything, I, um, I uh, did all the basic first aid. I, I stapled them up and sewed them up and, and intubated them and, and uh, catheterized them and all the things that you might need to do because you have to count on those other two people. There's just three of you, and you're the last people on Earth. So you, so you might never need a mechanic or a dentist, huh? uh, My wife loves me, but <laughs> she would not trust me to do dental surgery, <laughs> even if I was the last guy on Earth. <laughs> There's any volunteers? I, uh, <laughs> and you go out from the spaceship in 400 kilometers height. So it's a, a maximum of heights a, a human can reach. So how could you handle that? So I am afraid of heights. This one's okay. But, <laughs> but if I stand on the edge of, a, of any sort of cliff or, or an edge of a building, I get just a, a horrible feeling in my stomach and my legs feel all wobbly and it, my body is just screaming at me to get back away from the edge. Um, but if there's a big bar here, like a big thing to hold on to, and I know I can't fall, then I don't have that feeling. Or if, like if I was attached by a rope to the wall so that I knew I could not fall, then, then I don't feel the fear. And the real key is to understand the difference between actual danger and raw fear. And if you can study and learn and really understand, because even though you're in exactly the same place, if there's a rope and you know you can't fall, then there is no danger. And therefore, you can teach yourself to no longer have fear. And that applies to standing on a cliff, but it, it also applies to being a test pilot, because sitting in an airplane, you don't suddenly fall. And when you're on the space station, um, you're going the same speed as the space station, so even if you let go, you don't fall. So it's. The, the real key to it is to separate your instinctive fear by analyzing and practicing the actual danger. And if you can do that, it allows you to, to do and see things that otherwise would be denied to you in life. Um, how do you get to the idea to sing David Bowie's song, Space Oddity in Space? Um, it, it wasn't my idea. Um, uh, we launched just before Christmas. And my brother and I had written uh, a, a new Christmas carol, a space Christmas carol called Jewel in the Night. And uh, I recorded it, and uh, my son released it on SoundCloud, and tens of thousands of people heard that song. And as soon as they knew that there was a musician on the space station, suddenly all across the internet, people started asking for, uh, for me to record Space Audio who was helping with social media sent me a note saying, Dad, you gotta record Space Oddity. And I said, Space Oddity? And nobody covers Bowie. Plus, <laughs> plus, in that song, the astronaut dies at the end. <laughs> so, 
So I said, but my son, my son said to me, uh, this is by email back and forth. He said, Dad, you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for everybody else. So I made a deal with him, and I said, okay, if you rewrite the words so that the astronaut lives, then I'll, I'll make a recording of Space Island. Just when, when you're looking at the video, I want you to look for something. When, when I'm in the, uh, facing the camera with the world behind me, the world is really bright. And I, I, I didn't think the camera, I thought my face would be dark because the world is so bright behind me. And so I took two of the brightest, hottest lights on the space station, and I put one right here and the other one right here. And so it was like singing in an oven. <laughs> but with the camera angle, you don't really notice, but when you're looking at me where I'm staring straight at the camera and the world's behind me, look and you can see these two uh, clean lights right here next to my face. Okay, so... Yeah,
Wow. <lacht> Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, dass Sie so interessiert waren. Das war ganz toll. Wir haben noch ein bisschen Zeit für ein paar Fragen, aber nicht zu so viele, denn ganz viele Menschen möchten noch ein Autogramm haben, die ein Buch unterschrieben haben, ein Buch da erwerben, ein Foto machen, was auch immer.